Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Friends of the Dar, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Before you took your seats here at this hall, I am sure you have noticed the hall on your right as you came in. It was and continues to be the site of a major event at the Dar. It was called Modern Architecture in Kuwait between 1949 to 1989. It tells the story of architecture in Kuwait during this modern time. It is but one of an event that shows Dar al Athar al-Islamiyah's interest and support of the beautiful art of architecture. Tonight, we welcome to Dar al-Athar al-Islamiyah a professor of this art. Dr. Samir Mahmoud visits the Dar for the second time. He was Aga Khan postdoctoral fellow at MIT in 2011-2012, and he was Andrew Mellon's postdoctoral fellow at the Arts and Humanities Initiative at the American University of Beirut in 2013-2014. He is the author of several publications on Islamic aesthetics, Islamic philosophy, and is currently working on two new books. Tonight, he will discuss new perspectives on Islamic, on Islamic art, how and why it does non-figurative art move us and evoke our emotions. I search in the internet to see if he has done any research or writing on mobile phones. Didn't find any. So this should be a note for you to turn off your mobile phones and let's welcome Dr. Samir Mahmoud. Thank you for the uh, generous introduction and uh, thank you for uh, Sheikh Hossa for providing this wonderful forum for uh, me to really uh, express these um, ideas. Uh, the title of the lecture is New Perspectives on Islamic Art, Geometry, the Line, and Inhabiting the Realm of Reverie. Um, and the problematic is um, <clears throat> why do non-frequentive abstract patterns move us and evoke an emotion? Um, my assumption is that to a certain extent much of Islamic aesthetics is the search for the creative possibilities of non-frequentive art, as is many um, non-figurative uh, non uh, artistic traditions. And so the conclusions of this lecture today are also equally um, relevant for many other artistic traditions. My approach is quite unconventional, and um, I'm going to start with a disclaimer shortly, that it is quite interdisciplinary, uh, albeit often uh, ahistorical. Um, and it's a search for new aesthetic possibilities of meaning and creation by a contemporary Muslim scholar, myself, interested in... Um, uh, but to quote Shakir Hassan al Said, is still ham at Turath in, in multiple ways. I want to distinguish at the very beginning between the um, art historical question on the one hand and the aesthetic question on the other. What I'm about to um, show you it has nothing to do with answering the question what is the art historical meaning of the patterns that you'll see on the screen? It's rather uh, a more general question about uh, aesthetics i.e. Uh, the relevance um, and perceptual qualities of aesthetic patterns that are as relevant today as they were uh, several centuries ago, and I'll explain why uh, throughout the presentation. To visualize this interdisciplinary approach, I've had to draw on medieval Islamic sources, 19th century art history, 20th century abstract art, neuroscience, psychoanalysis, phenomenology, etc., cetera, um, late antique Neoplatonism, and I've summarized um, each one of these points uh, in these slides. To a certain extent, the narrative I'm about to tell you is a personal one. It's a personal journey and quest, in, uh, uh, qu quest for answering the question that I posed at the beginning of this lecture. And uh, so part of it is a historical narrative. It follows from Neoplatonism Neo all the way towards um, 21st century um, aesthetic uh, discourses. But to a large extent, it doesn't 
always follow this historical narrative. Neoplatonism is um, a platonic influenced, Aristotelian influenced philosophical tradition that flourished between the second, third century, well into the seventh century. Um, and what I found so interesting, what I find so interesting in Neoplatonism is um, the question of mathematical being. Many of those who have turned their attention to the study of Islamic um, art and architecture and the influences of Neoplatonism on the uh, aesthetic tradition usually talk about uh, emanation theory or other aspects. Um, I want to shed a little bit more light on the question of mathematical being because it was something that was discussed for several centuries and then carried over into the Islamic tradition. I think it provides the bedrock for a, a solid grasp of uh, what geometry and number actually are. For Pythagoras, most of you may be familiar with the uh, notion that um, cosmos is underpinned by number. And uh, the act of doing geometry, to a certain extent, habituates the soul to the intelligible principles uh, underpinning the numbers. So for Pythagoras, number, not numbers in terms of integers, so one, two, three, four, but the principles behind them underpin emanation and creation. We don't actually see numbers in the natural world, but nonetheless, they have some kind of invisible presence as principles that underpin. Um, and for Pythagoras, especially in the academy that he established in southern Italy, uh, doing geometry was a method or a means of habituating the soul for better understanding or grasp of the numerical uh, underpinning of the cosmos and the cosmic order. And I've summarized what my reading of Neoplatonic aesthetics uh, in the following manner. In Neoplatonism, a thing can exist in three different modalities. Everything has an intelligible existence, a level of the soul, a level of the sensible world. Um, so, for example, uh, each human being exists on the physical plane. We have a soul, so we exist on the level of the soul also. And we also have an intellect, so we, have, we exist also at the level of intellect. It's not so much that these are things within us, but we are within these three different levels of existence. To each of these uh, levels of existence, there was a corresponding faculty of knowledge. So, for the intelligible realm, we use our intellect for to understand matters of the soul, the imagination was fundamental. And to understand the sensible world or the physical world around us, the senses were vital. <clears throat> Things emanate from above, as it were, to below, not the other way around. And so everything above has a, more, uh, a greater degree of reality than the one below that. The goal of life was to ascend back to the heavens in the realm of the intelligible ideas. So we're fallen creatures, as it were, living in a sensible world. And the, the whole point is to ascend from the sensible to the level of imagination and soul in order to further contemplate the formless uh, principles of, that subside in the intellectual uh, realm or the intelligible realm. Now, one of the most problematic things in existence that troubled the Neoplatonists was mathematical objects. How do they exist? They're not physical things, and they're not purely intelligible things. And so they debated for centuries, what are mathematical things? If you look around you, you don't see geometry, you see physical things. Um, yet, somehow underpinning the physical world, there are numbers and there are geometric principles. And so they, and they thought, well, geometry can't be purely intellectual either because they are forms. They have a possessor form, they have a certain extension, certain measure. And so they postulated that perhaps geometrical objects are intermediate between the intelligible and sensible realm. And so mathematical objects are actually imaginal objects. They don't exist on the physical level. They don't exist on the intelligible level. They somehow participate in something in between these two realms. Why this is important is um, be explained a little bit later. Mathematical objects, or geometric objects, and number, therefore, are more complex than ideas and more precise than physical things. They have a degree of reality that's more real than sensible things, but less real than pure, intelligible principles. Somewhere exists. So number and geometry are the very stuff of the imagination and the language of the soul. They are projections from above and not abstractions from below. We often think geometry is an abstraction from the sensible world, the exact opposite. Geometric principles are, and numbers are actually projections from above. <clears throat> Imagination is the faculty for perceiving them and making them visualizable to an inner gaze of the mind. So the imagination is what provides geometry and number with 
the material substance. Um, so when we visualize geometry in our minds or numbers and equations, it's actually our imagination that's assisting us in providing a certain form for what is otherwise formless. So if you look at this one, this is a very, uh, very crude, very simple, um, but it's much easier for me to uh, explain in this way. But if we think of fourness, you know, for Pythagoras, one or oneness is a principle usually associated with the supreme deity, the one. And then there's the two, the principle of two, duality, the principle of three, for the Pythagorean and Neoplatonists is the first principle of creation. And four is associated with nature or the natural world. With four, we arrive at the level of physical things. So fourness is an abstract principle, best visualized with the square. But we don't see fourness in the physical world, we just see things. We see the four winds, the four directions, the four humors in the body, the four principles of this and the four principles of that. In a Neoplatonic cosmology, uh, everywhere you looked in the physical world, there was a, uh, the four was manifest somewhere. Four is the most stable form uh, associated with Earth, etc., etc. Uh, three was associated with different things. So in the physical world, you don't see the fours, you don't see geomet geometry or patterns. You just see things manifest by these principles. So we have the sensible world, we have the level of the soul, we have the intelligible realm. So, when we look at something like this for um, uh, geometric, we perceive its materiality by the senses. We see the small cubes of the, um, the pavement, but it, the actual forms, the circles and squares and the patterns, they're not perceived necessarily just by the senses, according to the Neoplatonists. Um, we perceive the primary principles uh, perceived by the intellect, and the geometric form is perceived in and by the imagination. So materiality is perceived by the senses. We can sense its material substance as small cubes and colors. The primary principle of four is some, something we intellectualize, we intellect, we intellect. But the geometric form that you see before your gaze or your physical eye is actually also perceived by the inner eye of the mind because these mathematical objects don't exist or subsist in the physical world. So what the artist here is essentially doing is bringing before your physical gaze an imaginal object. And through sustained contemplation, we ascend up to the level of the primal principles. Most of us are able to perceive innately the first two levels, the material substance, which is, induces some kind of pleasure, the geometric form that also uh, induces some kind of imaginal pleasure. But it's through sustained sustenance that we are able to uh, penetrate to the principle itself. And this is where the mystical interpretation comes in. So it's be very careful or reluctant to um, to, to uh, give a mystical um, interpretation, as it were, to geometry, because it requires sustained meditation and contemplation. So it's not something that happens automatically. That's why many scholars um, dismiss mystical interpretations of geometry, precisely because, um, well, immediately it doesn't offer that. It doesn't afford that. It requires sustained med meditation, as I'll show a little bit later. So what is the geometric image, once again? It is an embodiment of an immaterial and in invisible idea in the geometrical or intelligible matter of imagination. Such an image is a sui generi, it exists on its own terms, painted picture that is accessible in all of its detail and components at a single glance. That's the advantage of geometry. It offers the formless principle at one glance in one form. Everything that is contained in a mathematical form has a latent, hidden, secret, or concealed becomes visible in and through its image in the imagination. <clears throat> so, we contemplate the physicality or the material expression perceived by the senses on the floor, and we ascend to the geometric form, which is also perceived, but not so much by the senses, by the imagination. And then, through sustained meditation, we arrive at the principle which is perceived by the intellect. <clears throat> the physical beauty of the art originates in the archetypal forms abstracted by the artist from his understanding of the intelligible world, which eventually arouses pleasure and wonder in the spectator. Now, it's around this time that you find a lot of uh, Roman pavements being uh, created all over the Roman Empire. I'm not suggesting there's a historical link between the Neoplatonic meditations on geometry and the pavements at all, so I'm not uh, uh, interested in that question at this particular point. What I am interested in is the centuries of commentaries written by Neoplatonists discussing 
this thing called geometry and number and where it exists. Aesthetically speaking, that discussion is really, really important and very interesting because it carries over into the Islamic tradition, but also it's still extremely relevant today um, in contemporary uh, science. The issue of uh, geometry and number somehow neither physical nor intelligible, uh, but rather somehow persist subsisting in the realm of imagination. Um, but there were wonderful geometric patterns produced by the Romans in this particular period all over the Roman Empire. This geometry is absolutely exquisite and uh, mind-boggling. This uh, the one on the left is particularly interesting, um, I find, because uh, you'll see it a little bit later again. During the Islamic period from the 7th to 12th century, what you find is a number of very interesting developments. First of all, the uh, Muslims uh, inherit or a shared visual culture in the Near East, which is very Roman and Byzantine. There's a translation of Greek words into Arabic, including those of Euclides, Simplicius, and other Neoplatonists, those who wrote commentaries on Euclides and discussed the mathematical uh, object. Um, there's also the development at some point of the prohibition of the image is established norm, at least in sacred architecture and art, and the development of a non-figurative visual culture. And very interestingly enough also, a uh, perception of geometry as somehow a psychic space <coughs> and theories of khayal, imagination. If we look at the question of the shared visual culture, we'll find very easily um, the prevalence of these Roman patterns in the Byzantine tradition, in the Umayyad, and again in the Byzantine tradition. These arrows don't indicate influence, per se, necessarily, but it's supposed to be uh, the, um, the circulation of a, the same pattern through centuries in this, around the Mediterranean. And you can see by the Umayyad time, or at least by the Byzantine time, there's no image, and by the Umayyad time, absolutely no image, at least in the, in the pavement that you see there. The translation of major works into Arabic, Greek works, including the geometry of Euclides, uh, and the uh, commentaries of Simplicius and other Neoplatonists were um, discussed extensively by the Ikhwan Safa, and uh, many of you may be already familiar with the uh, Ikhwan Safa's uh, doctrine on the geometry as the aim of training the soul, uh, by which it realizes promotion in knowledge from perception to conception, from the physical to the spiritual, and from the concrete to the abstract. Geometry is of two kinds. There's a sensible and the intelligible kind. And so geometry becomes a mediator. It's, it's viewed as a creative and productive mode of contemplation. It connects sight to concepts through geometrical articulations which have a psychic subsistence. And geometry starts with a sensory experience, both visual and bodily. However, it is essentially an intellectual conceptual practice that leaves the self to ever unfolding potentialities of the unseen. The image you see on the right is a physical image, yes, but by virtue of being a geometric pattern, it also subsists in, as an imaginal image and in a psychic space. We often assume what we're looking at is just at the physical plane, but the Neoplatonists would have us believe otherwise. The physicality is perceived by the senses, but the pattern itself already invites us into a psychic space or imaginal space of its own. And that's one of the reasons why we seem to be dazzled and drawn into some kind of a reverie or a trance state when we look upon some patterns like this, it's because we're gazing literally into an imaginal space of the soul. Therefore, we can conclude with Hans Belting that to a certain extent in the Islamic world, geometry became a symbolic form by being a subject of representation rather than a tool for representation as it was later in the Renaissance. An object or a uh, subject of representation is very different aesthetic system from being a tool for representation. And therein lies the huge difference. Two different aesthetic systems influenced by, uh, although the Ren Renaissance was influenced by Neoplatonism, um, the prevalence of figures and image dominated the, is the tendency towards challenging, challenging a lot of the energy towards uh, exploring the aesthetic possibilities of geometry and pattern. I think uh, the Islamic tradition can be given credit for really pushing the boundaries of this and the logic of uh, geometry and pattern to its logical conclusion, as we'll see a little bit later. The prohibition on the image in the, uh, it becomes an established norm by, um, by the early centuries in the Islamic tradition, and it pushes the, uh, the energy of Islamic culture towards what um, Guru Nechipoglu calls 
develop a system or elaborate system of non-figural patterning, patterning um, or an aesthetic theory that privileged the imagination's ingenious abstracting capacities over naturalistic representation, mm? um, therefore creating or arousing a sense of pleasure and wonderment. Uh, likewise, Oleg Grabar discusses the development of this um, emerging visual culture of the ninth century. If you look as early as the Umayyad period, you can see that pavement there on the right-hand side, not so much the uh, lion and gazelle one, but on the right-hand side here, you can see the prevalence of geometric patterns. And if you look closely, the surface here is covered by a stucco. Um, and um, Grabar des describes it as a quite conscious attempt to emphasize surface over shape. But it can be misleading, slightly misleading, because it's not so much um, surface that is being emphasized here, but um, something else entirely. According to the, this Neoplatonic notion of mathematical being, when a surface is covered, as it is here, with these patterns, the space in between is not the same at all. These spaces, the geometric patterns here, open up a space of their own. They open up a space of their own, and so the surface, though covered, is actually opening up uh, a new space uh, altogether. A space that is not so much necessarily just in the depths of the, uh, the wall itself, but within the imagination of the perceiver. And this is what the uh, Neoplatonists emphasize again and again. And I'm going to show you a little bit later, contrasting two different domes, where this really comes out, this juxtaposition. So geometry becomes a form of mediation. Um, now, although I think Grabard emphasizes mediation as something that um, questioning of meanings by changing them into uh, pleasure, uh, I would suggest that um, a mediation of an entirely uh, different sort. Uh, I think Ibn Arabi comes closer to an understanding of this kind of mediation. But in any case, uh, Ibn Arabi would later clearly articulate the idea um, that given Islam's primordiality as a religion that encompasses all religious forms, it cannot create any specific image of the divine or the sacred except in the imagination, as I'm going to explain a little bit later. The virtue of geometry then is that it is already imaginal in form and substance or sustenance. It admits of no specific image but rather invites a multiplicity of images. This is really a crucial point that I'm going to emphasize a little bit later. But um, the issue of um, banning the image or figurative image in religious art is not so much to place a, a constraint on the creative energies of the imagination, but rather to unleash them. The next very important uh, uh, point is perception of geometry as a psychic space, and this is a throwback to uh, Neoplatonic theories of perception that we find in the Al-Farabi, Ikhwan safa and Ibn Sina where perception was seen as much a theory of seeing as it was a theory of psychology, whereby particularly relevant is the way they discuss and describe perception of geometry as a mode of relaxing the soul or instilling a sense of repose. Theories of perception of beauty and geometry during this period tended to emphasize the effect it has on the soul. Therefore, perception unfolds within a realm of interiority. Once again, the theory of perception here is simultaneously a theory of psychology and the effects it has on the soul. And you find most descriptions of uh, geometry discussing its effects. Not so much the mechanism. I'm going to explain the mechanism later because I think it comes uh, in later, um, in later uh, theories. But um, Human Kholiji uh, came out with a book recently uh, in between architectural drawing and imaginative knowledge in Islamic and Western traditions. It's a really interesting book. And he takes one of these uh, giddy kind of models, geometric models from the top copy scroll and uh, inserts these eyes in the middle of the, the patterns there. And he says, once the construction lines comprised of circles and radii is conceived, the imaginative eye of the draftsman inhabits the drawing and makes connections between nodes of intersection and future visible lines of the geometric pattern. And it's very, very accurate because that's precisely what happens. The undulating lines of geometric patterns invite the eye uh, into the very space un uh, unfolded by the geometry itself. And it seems to inhabit the psychic space opened up by the geometry. Um, a wall or a pattern without geometric uh, pattern and a wall with one is an entirely different wall uh, altogether. And this notion 
of the eye somehow inhabiting the, the, the pattern itself is very consistent with the, what we said earlier about mathematical object as subsisting between a sensible and the intelligible uh, realm. And uh, he says, he goes on to, to, to say also that as an aperture to the imaginal, these architectural or art drawings open the door to a world of its own, wherein the drawing has a true, subtle existence of its own. In this view, the drawing starts from the domain of human imagination in the middle, with the possibility of either ascending to the realm of the intellect or at the same time descending with the an artist's hand towards the built or made object. Seen in this way, the imaginal drawing can offer an in-between state of being and becoming. A subtle matter, lighter than the building or physical pattern and denser than the idea, essentially representing a mode of consciousness involving the conscious imagination. <clears throat> this leads us very quickly also to the remarkable theories of the imagination, without which we can't really understand how geometry allows this ascent. The arc of ascent from the sensible to the transcendental is made possible through geometry. As we saw earlier, Ikhwan al-Safa defined geometry as having some kind of an aim of training of the soul. Training of the soul. This view of geometry lends itself well to a mystical, anagogical understanding of geometry as a hoist for the imagination and a means of making the visible, uh, in, uh, invisible visible. And this is particularly true um, when we look at the stages of um, the evolution of the pa this pattern that we're looking at. In the 10th to 13th century, it was characterized by a intellectual mode of geometry, as um, Mr. Poglo has uh, brilliantly shown. Um, the second stage from the 13th to 16th century comes under the influence of a lot of elaborate mystical associations with geometric patterns. And then by the 17th, 18th century, many of the patterns become a catalog for design where artists imitate the patterns from the catalogs. But it's the influence, under the influence of people like Ibn Hanabi, Suhrawardi, Nasir al-Din al-Tusi, and Qutb al-Din al-Shirazi, who all have one thing in common, is the elaborate theory of the imagination that they uh, wrote about, especially particularly Ibn Arabi, uh, who initially uh, developed this theory of the imagination to explain the relationship between the one and the many, which was a philosophical project for the Neoplatonists, but more importantly, it was a way in which he could explain the relationship between the one, al-Ahad, wal kathra the cosmos. Without getting into this particular theory of the imagination, um, basically, essentially, um, the imagination draws on the images of the physical world. All of us look at things around us all the time, and our imagination stores all these images. So the imagination forms or ascend uh, are spiritualized, and then somehow when we want to give form, when we have a vision of a something from the spiritual world, we often give it a form that we're familiar with from the physical world, which is why in visions, although um, certain prophets or certain visions of Al-Arsh or whatever it is uh, from the intelligible realm of the spiritual world don't have real forms per se, the reason why we see them in a particular form, a form familiar with, from, for us from the phys physical world, is because the imagination with its storehouse of all these images, somehow, like in a dream state, it puts them together and configures these invisible things into a visible thing only at the level of imagination. And so geometry is, for these writers, an imaginal space. An imaginal space that's located, once again, between the spiritual world and the sensible world. And this geometric pattern that you see before your eyes, we are able to perceive the material work with our physical senses, but we perceive the geometry itself at the level of imagination, a psychic space or imaginal space. And contemplating it long enough, we might arrive at a abstract or um, formless principle underlying particularly that central pattern there. One could, for example, meditate on that central pattern as Ibn Arabi has. And so for geometry, is particularly used by him, particularly Ibn Arabi, for the expression of spiritual principles. So if you look at a pattern like this, for example, Contemplating this pattern long enough, the star in the middle is related to the, the, um, the, the points on the circumference in a particular way. And he uses the image of the circle to explain the relationship between the, the center, which is the divine point of creation, and the periphery. These various modes are not necessarily mystical. Geometry isn't essentially mystical, but contemplated long enough is so. But there's a problem. 
up until this point, all, all of this is fine and well, and um, it sounds very interesting. But it's, for a modern audience, we have to uh, confess, is um, to a certain extent not very convincing. Wonderful metaphysics, wonderful cosmology, but there's, there's something lacking. And I found this something lacking in myself, and I kept on pushing and pushing and pushing to find this question, and I realized that modernity, we are products of modernity. We are modern individuals, and the missing link is our ability to really make sense of this transition from the sensible to the middle period, uh, middle uh, stage here. The missing conceptual link is that between our sensible world and the imaginal. How does it actually happen? Well, we're modern individuals, and we're products of the Cartesian duality of subject and object, unfortunately. And we stand on the, this side of a chasm separating us from the external world. What do I mean by that? Well, for pre-modern man, <coughs> the self existed within the world. Meaning that um, when um, Ghazali and Ibn Sina and others talk about the effect or influence of geometry on the soul, this is precisely because the world is within us and we are within the world. This is the traditional cosmology. The only way you are able to actually understand anything in the cosmos according to the traditional cosmology is because we already have it contained within us. We are within the world and the world is within us. But we're not that. We are conceptually and epistemologically these, this poor fellow here. We uh, often think of ourselves as separate individuals right there with ourself somehow contained within this physical body. This is modern subjectivity and the world stands over there against us. And we often ask ourselves, how do I make this link between me and the pattern, me and geometry, me and God? Um, because we don't subscribe to this traditional cosmology, which made things a lot easier. <clears throat> and th herein comes the question, that is, at this particular point, humanity asks themselves, why do non-figurative abstract patterns move us and evoke an emotion? Because we have to make this, we have to bridge this link between self here and, um, and, and the world out there. But for pre-modern man, the self was not contained by the physical body, uh, necessarily. And this chasm here is very difficult to, to bridge. And again, I thought to myself, well, <clears throat> there must be an answer to this question. And I began searching and searching uh, in 18th, 19th century writers, and I began discovering that these authors, who are modern subjects, uh, post-medieval subjects, if you will, were asking very similar questions. And the rest of these slides are my intellectual journey. In 18th century English aesthetics, for example, I found the writings of William Hogarth on the line of beauty very stimulating. William Hogarth describes the serpentine line or the vital line as somehow um, in every object in nature and in the natural world, um, er, the most beautiful things in the world are always animated by a curved line. In fact, he describes the most beautiful line in the world as the curved line. Um, and he, I think at some point someone describes the fact that uh, there isn't a single straight line in a woman's body. But if you look at nature, you don't find any straight lines. Curved lines are uh, the vital lines or the serpentine lines, as he calls it. This abstract line or this vital line, line of life, somehow is abstract but has an implicit movement that elicits and engages a beholder's perception and imagination. The serpentine line flirts with the imagination, calling on it pleasurably, even as the line itself becomes invisible. Right? We are drawn and moved by it somehow. But that didn't really explain much. I had to explore further. And in the writings of 19th century Ruskin, I found something quite interesting. He talks of the vital lines and also curved lines, influenced as he was by Hogar. Uh, you must ascertain by experiment that all beautiful objects wh whatsoever are thus terminated by delicately curved lines. And Ruskin did a very interesting experiment. He discovered that if you draw the line that animates every living thing, uh, you find that they all have a similar curved line. And all one, every single one of these lines is actually, I wouldn't call the outline, but a line that somehow he abstracted or felt in a mountain, a leaf, a tree, a stone, a pebble, uh, the earth. And if you really think about it, if you draw or trace any one of these elements, you'll come across very similar lines. And he was constantly asking himself, how is it that we find Gothic ornaments so animated? And he proposed this vital line as an important uh, component. <clears throat> 
Ruskin refers to them as abstract lines, not to be understood in the usual sense of abstract, but as that which inhabits the real because it is inscribed in the life process itself. That confused me a little bit until I came across 19th century German tradition on Einfuhlen. And this tradition, and this quote, that I, the question at the beginning of this lecture is really derived from Heinrich Wolflin. How is it possible that architectural or art forms are able to express or invoke an emotion or a mood? If you look at the trees, we're deeply moved by these. We're also equally moved by this um, Baroque structure as it protrudes out into the piazza in Rome or the elevated columns of a Gothic cathedral in Siena, the Pictish stone on the left with its Celtic knot, or the patterns on the right. We are moved by these patterns, and somehow we're at a loss as to explain how or why. Equally, these Islamic patterns here. And this, the answer was, as proposed in 19th century art history, empathy. We often think of empathy as something that happens between us and other human beings. Empathy means to feel into uh, something. So I empathize with you, I feel with your pain. I project myself into you, your state of being, put my sh myself in your shoes in order to understand what is going on uh, inside you. That is empathy. But what uh, Wolfen was suggesting was, what, what, what this tradition was proposing is that empathy actually obtains also between us and inanimate things. Vischer, for example, in the early 19th century proposed that vertical lines, or he noted that vertical lines elevate the human spirit, horizontal lines broaden it, while curved lines move more energetically than straight lines. He's experimenting on himself and a few other people. And we, I, I think all of us can agree with this conclusion. And he explained the brain's impulse uh, to fashion this symbolic and emotional reconfiguration of the world. And he often talked about the fact that we move with something suggests almost a pantheistic or animistic urge to read our emotions and ourselves in the forms of the sensual world. Vicious speculated that a horizontal line might be pleasing because it conforms to the structure of our visual apparatus, because visually speaking, we have two eyes, horizontally speaking, so a horizontal line is more balanced with our perceptual system. A vertical line uh, requires uh, a movement upwards across um, our perceptual system. Uh, whereas a diagonal line is less so because it requires an awkward movement of the eye across. A line with a gentle arc is more pleasing than a jagged one because of the congenial nerve movements it induces. So he was kind of delving into uh, early neurology or neuroscience at the time. He also uh, noticed that when we elevate these sensations to the level of feelings, we also engage a score of other psychological responses. We, sent, we tend to contract ourselves when we perceive a small shell, and we expand ourselves to a certain extent if we perceive something quite large. The point of all this is that our empathetic relationship with an object is at heart a physiognomic or an emotional one. We have a physiognomic understanding of the world because we have bodies, and this relationship inspires empathy when we read our emotions and personalities into the objects of the world. This happens at an unconscious level, and we're not always aware of it. If you're asking yourself, I'm not aware of me doing this, it's because it happens at a very, very unconscious level. It's actually part of the way in which we engage with the world. And his preliminary definition of this unconscious empathetic process is, empathy is the unconscious projection of our own bodily form and with this also the soul, into the form of the object. He, pro he suggested we empathize by projecting ourselves into. Now, the reason why I've highlighted into is because it's very different from onto. Onto is when I'm angry and I project my anger onto you, this anger is within me that I'm projecting onto you. It's got nothing to do with you. Projecting into something suggests that there's an encounter where the other is eliciting my empathetic response. So. The line invites and elicits my response. So there's a two-way street here. It's not just myself projecting onto the other. <coughs> Take a Gothic column, for example. In the following decade, a wonderful scholar by the name of Theodore Lips wrote, had this to say. The form is always the being formed by me. It is my activity, i.e., the column seems to be twisting under the effect of a force. And as it does so, it takes on a certain form. As the column takes on form, we start to feel it too, an almost psychosomatic twisting, and then we take on form by adjusting our position or posture. 
things become feelings and feelings become things. Yani, the thing that is twisting is felt as a feeling within. This is empathy. <clears throat> or if we take, for example, the Laocoon, Roman sculpture. It is my activity. It is, the form is not just there. I can only understand it by empathizing with it and enacting that same form that I perceive. It's a being formed by me. I.e., the sculpture feels or embodies the terror of death. This is Laocoon with his two sons uh, just before they um, are, uh, meet their doom. The terror of death takes on form, and as it takes on form, we start to feel it too. Not a physical terror, but terror. And then we take on form by adjusting our position or posture. If one were to map and trace terror, we get the same form of a body writhing and twisting and turning. Things become feelings, and feelings become things. Likewise with Duchamp's uh, descending nude. It somehow captures a movement illusion, but the movement is not actually in the painting. The movement is there because we enact the movement in our body through this empathetic engagement. <coughs> Likewise with um, the, the um, I want to read this out, but it's a bit too long. Um, but likewise with all other artistic forms, how is it possible that architectural art forms are able to express and invoke an emotion? I had part of the answer. Fascinating theory, but it lacked veri verification because it was anchored in art historical speculations. Nonetheless, it remained influential for many artists. In the 20th century, the search for the uh, abstract possibilities of the line um, were well on its way. And most of you are familiar with the possibilities of abstract art and the search with and thinking through the material by exploring the possibilities of pure form and pure color. And uh, hopefully at a later date, I can uh, dedicate an entire lecture to color, which is my uh, uh, another paper or research that I'm working on, color and its significance. But something like this by Kandinsky, the inner life of forms and the inner necessity it has. Kandinsky often was convinced that certain lines, certain shapes, certain colors have definite effect on the soul. This is a universal um, language of form. Uh, images have different effects, but geometry and uh, lines were universal. And he was in search for this universal uh, language of form. And uh, Grabar and many others noticed very early on the resemblance or the similarities between this 20th century abstract search for universal language and the uh, universal language of geometry developed by uh, Islam or in the Islamic tradition. <coughs> Kandinsky's search for a universal language was presaged by Muslim artists and many non-figurative artistic traditions, Celtic, tribal, uh, many other traditions. In the 20th century, we also um, have the uh, contributions of psychoanalysis that I found were quite interesting. Um, especially the notion of projections and the form of pleasure. You may be familiar with uh, this scene here from Inception. Anyone seen the movie Inception? Yeah, well in the movie, you have this particular scene here, which is actually a fortress in the snow, um, and it is nothing but the actual inner part of the person where he's hiding a secret. So everyone's trying to get into that fortress in the dream within the dream within a dream, but the fortress is actually nothing but the innermost part of that person's self where he's hiding a secret. So, uh, but the point of this slide is to show you that um, psychoanalysis speculated that because imagination lacks a rational framework during the, pre the process of dreaming, it must translate ideas into visual impressions. So in a dream, we already project parts of ourselves into forms. A headache, for example, might prompt a dream of spiders darting about on the ceiling, or as in this case, uh, Jung dreamt of his self as a three-story house with his ego or consciousness in the middle and, um, uh, and this kind of hierarchy. Or we often um, depict um, a journey down to the depths of our soul as we see it as a downward movement through uh, a staircase. What's so interesting about this is that just as in dreaming we project ourselves into images that become aspects of ourselves, Likewise, when we perceive a building with vertical lines, horizontal lines, crevices, cornices, mass, volume, we project ourselves into the building because it elicits our empathetic gaze. It makes a claim on our body and we see ourselves in the entire building. And I think many of you have had the experience of standing before a Gothic cathedral, literally feeling the texture of the surface in your body. Um, <clears throat> Likewise, also, what I found so interesting in psychoanalysis, and something that I think wasn't really uh, touched upon by uh, many scholars, is the idea of pleasure, but not just any kind of pleasure. Um, 
I found in the writings of Julia Kristeva, a psychoanalyst, wonderful writings on uh, prenatal existence. You know, psychoanalysis focused on the influence of childhood on later life. Uh, Kristeva really emphasized uh, the effect of prenatal life, life in the womb. Life in the womb is really interesting because in the womb we occupy a realm of pure equilibrium, tension, temperature, vibration, rhythm, tempo, duration, and resonance. And these are the same words you would often describe, used to describe geometry. It seems far-fetched, but it's a very, very interesting theory that the synesthetic multi-sensory field that we experience in the womb, where we were still one with the mother, or uh, in a field of non-differentiation, where we didn't have an ego, we didn't have an I, this realm of oneness, as it were, of experience, was a, a realm of pure textures and tones and colors. And later in life, according to Kristeva, we return to a realm of pure rhythm, an ecstatic out of ourselves experience, and we daydream when we're absorbed in playing, in ecstasy, in rapt contemplation. Okay? Moments that resemble and take us back to this primordial moment in the womb. Now, of course, psychoanalysis doesn't go further than that by discussing the primordial realm of our pre existence in, in, in God. But this idea of occupying a pure realm of equilibrium and tension and temperature and rhythm and vibration and tempo and duration in the womb, I found quite interesting because she says something quite interesting when we contemplate something like this or like this. All the colors, but blue in particular, would have a non-centered or decentering effect, lessening both object identification and phenomenal fixation. In the world, when, when I see you here today, I, you know, I have a, there's an object over there, and I'm over here, subject and object. And early childhood, I learned that I am an I and you're a separate person. So, but when we gaze at something like this, it's particularly the overwhelming figures and the color, it has the capacity to lessen our ability to identify distinctions between things. They thereby return the subject to the archaic moment of its dialectic. That is, before the fixed specular I, the process before we broke away into this distinction between mother and the other, or I and, uh, and the other. Um, this is a small piece of the puzzle that I found really, really fascinating. But in any case, then I discovered 21st century neuroscience and its notion of embodied simulation. And what I found here was quite revolutionary. This really changed the, the game for me. Cognitive neuroscience has now proven that vision is multimodal which involves the activation of motor, somatosensory, uh, and emotional related part of the brains, which means basically that every act of vision is also accompanied by an emotional content, and, any, uh, and vice versa, a motor content. So, an emotional response to the world invokes a motor content, and likewise, a motor response to the world involves a emotional content. The idea that perception is somehow a passive thing that happens to us um, is an outdated uh, notion entirely. Every act of perception, an emotional response to the world, for example, involves a part of the brain that's usually responsible for doing something. Now that relationship is really interesting. That fascinated me. It is interesting to note that the act of grasping something involves a similar process to the act of observing someone grasping something, which means if I hold up a cup, or if I hold up this, the same part of my brain that is activated, the motor part that is involved for motor activity, when I hold this up, the same part of you, my brain is activated in your brain in order for you to understand that I'm holding up something. Which means that when you sit there perceiving my actions, your brain is activating the same part of the brain uh, in order to understand the act. Which means that perception is very, very active. Below the level of consciousness, your brain is doing a lot more than you think or assume. So every action, the same part of your brain is activated, and this they call mirror neurons. I'm not going to go into the whole description here. You can uh, have a read of it later if you like, or uh, in the paper. But what's, what's so fascinating about this is that we kind of mirror each other. We mirror each other. Something similar happens when we perceive other people. When perceiving others expressing disgust or experiencing touch or pain, the same part of the brains are activated as when we subjectively experience the same emotion or sensation. Though the content is different, the same parts of the brain are activated. Now, what's the relationship between this and art? Well, 
Neuroscience has been confirming many of the findings of the 19th century theorist of empathy that we saw earlier. The 19th century theory of empathy, whereby we project ourselves into forms in order to feel them, are actually quite correct. It seems that the feeling of physical involvement with a painting, a sculpture, or an architectural form provokes a sense of imitating the motion or action seen while triggering the enhancing our emotional responses to it. The movement or image seen is unconsciously simulated by the perceiver, i.e., embodied simulation basically means that we simulate the world around us in order to understand it. So when I walk around this room here, my body simulates the vertical lines, the horizontal lines, it simulates your movements bodily. We don't actually act it out. You may say, well, I don't really actually act it out. Of course you don't. But the body nonetheless simulates it uh, in any case. Something similar happens in dreams. When we, um, when we go to a dream at night, uh, the, the mind sees many things, but the body secretes or the brain secretes a substance to prevent the body from actually acting it out. Otherwise, we'd be walking zombies all night and the world would not have progressed a single day. But in waking consciousness, um, your body is always actively doing something, which means perception is never passive. Things don't happen to us. We're always doing things and encountering the action of other things. For example, <coughs> the beholder's eye not only captures relevant data about shape, direction, and texture of the cut strokes, for example, but by means of embodied simulation, they emulate the motor activities or expression the artist used when creating these strokes. The same activities that the artist used to create this stroke is mimic or embodied through your embodied simulation. You feel it within your body because precisely that's what is actually happening. So when, we, when you say the world touches me or I've been touched, we usually use it metaphorically, but it's actually now proven quite literally. We are literally touched because we embody the movement and enact it. And the studies, these studies were done on these actual paintings. These are not my examples. These were actually from the study on neuroscience where subjects were subjected to um, uh, studies and the uh, MRI scans showed the same part of the brains being activated. Similarly, in this particular painting by Lucio Fontana, similar motor simulation of hand gestures was observed in participants beholding a cut on a canvas by Lucio Fontana or the dynamic brush strokes on canvas by Franz Kling. These experiences are also triggered in spatial experiences. This same ha thing happens with mirror neurons in spatial experiences and during the contemplation of objects. We similarly empathize or simulate the gestures we find in paintings or the forces of mass and the play of ornament in the same way. When we gaze at any one of these things here, the same thing is happening. We look at something like this on the right-hand side. The body literally attempts to simulate and mimic the infinite movements of the lines itself getting caught up in this imaginal space that's unfolding. That's why we get lost in it, and not at a distance, but actually, literally, inside it. Embodied simulation, therefore, as we have already seen with Vishu, not only connects us to others, but to the world around us. And this, remember the image I showed you of the modern subject and the world? Well, we can now bring them back together, because what this theory has shown is that we're actually always interacting and connected to things around us. We're not, we don't stand over against other things. I don't walk into this room and say, I'm going I'm to look at this column. The moment I walked in, I'm already engaged at an unconscious level with and assimilated the movements of, of the column around me. Not only that, but also our relationship to all things animate and inanimate is as a result affect laden and relational, i.e. there's always an emotional content to every act of perception. An emotion doesn't come later. It's actually part of the perceptual act itself. <coughs> Likewise, when we look at all these works of art, <coughs> very quickly, I want to then um, move on to the uh, next piece of the puzzle, which is um, phenomenology, particularly in the works of uh, Valerie Gonzalez in her book, Beauty and Islam. Uh, what I find so interesting about this, uh, this theory is that um, uh, given that uh, neuroscience has shown that our brains haven't changed much in 150,000 years, and given that geometry is, does not possess a psychic or personal existence, but rather an ontologically universal one, it is objectively there for everyone. The, um, our engagement with geometric patterns is um, very common. 
because we share the same perceptual system and same neurological system. I'm not saying that there are other cultural levels of meaning to engaging with uh, geometric patterns, but I'm just talking about the perceptual experiences. So when I go into the Alhambra, without understanding what the pattern may have meant to the people who built it, I can to a certain extent fairly say that um, at some level, we're sharing some kind of perceptual experience that's quite similar. What phenomenology provides with is really is a very interesting tool for Gonzalez to distinguish between three different kinds of geometries in the Alhambra, the imaging kind of geometry, the kinetic geometry, and the conceptual geometry. And when you pair these different kinds of geometries with what we said earlier, the Alhambra all of a sudden becomes much, much more interesting. Imaging geometry is a kind of geometry that produces or generates a, an image. So for example, look, look at the Comadas Hall here, for example. The Comadas Hall um, and beneath the Kumaras Hall, for those of you who are familiar with it, there are verses from Surat al-Mulk that describe the seven heavens. And scholars for uh, a brief period of time thought that the, uh, the Kumaras Hall represented the heavens. But um, we now know that um, the ascetic system or device operating here is not one of representation, but something entirely um, different. <coughs> Very quickly, the imaging geometry here, to distinguish let's distinguish between these two kinds of uh, paintings here or uh, images. This is a Baroque dome of the seven heavens and this is the Comaras Hall of the seven heavens. And what's happening here are two very different ascetic systems. Here, representation of the image is actually on the dome itself. Here, there's no representation, but there's a reproduction of the same perceptual qualities that you see when you actually see at, gaze at a starry sky. And so what it's doing is it, through the empathetic engagement with the geometric patterns of the sky, it acting on the perceptual system, hinting at and suggesting the starry heaven, but the image of the starry heaven is actually generated in your uh, own imagination. And so the image in the above one is not actually on the dome itself, but within the imagination of the beholder, whereas the image here is literally before your eyes to gaze at. Two very different aesthetic systems operating uh, here. The second one, the second kind of geometry found in the Alhambra is a kinetic one, which doesn't necessarily suggest a particular image, but suggest movement itself, as you can clearly see uh, there. And the third wonderful image there, I once asked my students to try to figure out how many elements there are on this particular uh, pattern here, and they couldn't really agree on, on any, anything. It really depends on how far you stand away from this particular um, pattern here. And the third kind of geometry, which is a conceptual kind of geometry, that really reveals the purity of geometric form before your very eyes. And there's no movement, there's no particular image generated, but it seems like the visualization of a pure mathematical demonstration of, uh, of, of truth or mathematical uh, uh, formula. One plus one equals two is a simple truth, undeniable, as is the conceptual immutable truth and reality of this perfect geometry that you see here. Again, this kind of geometry, the physicality of itself is perceived by the senses, the geometric patterns are actually occupying somewhere in between and contemplated long enough, they um, allow you to arrive at the, um, <coughs> at the um, level of the intelligibles. Um, I wanted to show you uh, these particular, um, this particular book here and this particular summary of uh, non-figurative Islamic art there. Um, but the, to go to the very last one here, um, <coughs> Uh, what I want to talk about really is the way in which the abstract line simulates movement within our body and elicits an empathetic gaze. That it creates a psychic imaginal space that invites an intimate involvement that we feel in our body. That it presupposes that we perform the activity, i.e. if you really want to get to terms with um, abstract patterns, don't study figurative art, study music and, and theater they have a lot more in common because this kind of art, the abstract art, presupposes that you have to perform through a body simulation, the actual lines. So it's performative. It invites an embodied performative activity. And um, the perceptual pull of uh, abstract uh, images like this, for example, the mihrab here, direction of Mecca, invites a kind of imaginative visualization of the sacred rather than an actual image. And the last, not least, um, virtual reality and immersivity. And what I'm suggesting here is the, the idea that um, Islamic art 
has a lot in common with virtual reality. And what am I mean by that? Uh, virtual reality is reality that is somehow virtual, i.e. is not necessarily physical or concrete, not in the sense that it's not real. Uh, virtual reality today is usually understood in the context of games or online. Uh, but virtual reality technically literally means an imaginal world that subsists somehow, that is neither physical nor non-physical. And the similarities between them are uh, quite remarkable. And Laura Marx, the scholar here, has done some wonderful work on looking at the relationship or the similarities between digital art and Islamic art. Um, <coughs> and if you were to look at the digital art done here on the right-hand side, on the left-hand side, um, both attempt to create a virtual reality, of course, but the one on the left is uh, within the context of a sacred aura of the divine word directed towards uh, God, as opposed to the one on the right, which somehow floats within a fantastic imaginal space of its own. Um, I'm going to end it with this one here, with this particular slide, because it's uh, quite beautiful. Um, I've deliberately not given the names of the places here, because I really want to focus not on the historicity, but the actual aesthetic qualities and effects of this Mukarnas. Looking at something like this, if you were to combine all the perspectives that I just alluded to earlier, I think we are in a much better position to begin to better understand the aesthetic properties of non-figurative art and the way in which they move us, to invite our imagination to literally uh, project ourselves into them through an empathetic gaze, embodied simulation, um, and allied with neoplatonic uh, metaphysics and cosmology, the manner in which once we enter into this psychic space through sustained contemplation, we're able to ascend through the intelligible realm. Without this neoplatonic metaphysics and cosmology, it remains a fantastic art of virtual reality, uh, and interesting uh, still nonetheless. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>